Good morning, everyone. Uh, we have our uh, guest speaker today, uh, Dr. Natasha Dabe from uh, Baylor College of Medicine. She is an assistant professor of medicine in the Department of Nephrology there uh, and has uh, clinical and uh, research interests in chronic kidney disease, I see. So that is uh, really excited to have you today, Natasha, and it's an important topic for our audience and we look forward to the talk. And over on the other side, we have a live audience from Mobingo Baptist Hospital in Cameroon, which is rural Cameroon, but this is a, a great internal medicine residency class, and we are really excited uh, about this partnership. So we really look forward um, to the talk. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, without further ado, let's jump into chronic kidney disease. I just wanted to take a second to ruminate on why I decided to choose chronic kidney disease and not something more interesting like glomerular nephritis or electrolytes acid base. For me, chronic kidney disease is an incredibly interesting process. It affects almost every organ system in the body and you have so many interesting pathophysiologic issues that happen as a result of this disease. And I'm a firm believer that if no matter where you are in the world, if you treat chronic kidney disease well, you can delay progression of the disease and prevent dialysis. So good management of chronic kidney disease is something that we um, are focusing on here in the United States and hopefully around the world, and I'm really excited to jump into this topic. My only conflict of interest today is I'm part of the medical advisory board for a chronic metabolic acidosis drug called Viveramir or Triceta. I will mention it briefly in this talk um, just because it's um, part of chronic kidney disease management. Um, the overview and objectives for today's talk um, I want everyone to walk out of here being comfortable with the definition and classification of chronic kidney disease. Next, we're also going to make sure, um, do patients actually have chronic kidney disease? So we want to make sure that we evaluate and treat any reversible causes of kidney failure. Because one of the first questions you have to ask yourself when you see these patients is, am I dealing with acute kidney injury? The next, we're going to talk about preventing and slowing the progression of the disease, as well as treatment of many of the complications. And lastly, if we have time, um, I'm going to try and fit in a very quick section on how to identify when someone's ready to start dialysis and what types of dialysis modalities or renal replacement therapy we have. So let's get started on defining and classifying chronic kidney disease. Um, chronic kidney disease, very simply, is abnormalities of kidney structure or, or function that's present for greater than three months. Either of the following must be present. So your GFR, which is your glomerular filtration rate, should be below 60 mLs per minute. You have to have an albumin-creatinine ratio of greater than 30 milligrams per gram and any marker of kidney damage. That means if you have a history of a kidney transplant um, and your GFR is completely normal, you have no albuminuria, you still have chronic kidney disease. If you are born with a horseshoe kidney or if you're born with just one kidney, again, that's chronic kidney disease. Any sort of tubular dysfunction that you develop, for example, RTA, renal tubular acidosis, that's kidney disease. And the last thing is, is if you have urine sediment, active urine sediment, so hematuria, white blood cell casts, or um, any sort of cast in your urine, that is kidney disease. When you Google kidney disease, um, you always see this very colorful classification. And I love this table. It's developed by um, this international group called KDGO. Essentially, we have five stages of kidney disease, G1 through G5. Um, we really start to diagnose kidney disease once you're below G3A in the absence of proteinuria. Um, G3A is a GFR of 45 to 59. G3B is 30 to 44, G4 is 15 to 29, and G5, which is the last stage of kidney disease, is when your GFR is below 15%. And usually, typically before this stage is when we start dialysis planning. And then I'm going to point you to our A1 through A3 category. We now have staging criteria for proteinuria because we found that proteinuria, worsening proteinuria actually increases progression of kidney disease. We have A1, 
which is a normal to mild increase in proteinuria, A2, which is a proteinuria of 30 to 300 milligrams per gram, and A3, which is, um, and this is all albumin to creatinine ratio. A3 is um, an albumin to creatinine ratio of greater than 300 milligrams per gram. The colors are really here to just kind of explain what your risks are. You can see that green is low risk, yellow is moderate risk, orange is high risk, and red is very high risk. And I just want to point um, your attention to one thing here, which is the A3 category for G1 and G2. So even if you have normal kidney function, which is defined as a GFR greater than 60, if you have proteinuria, you are still at a very high risk. So proteinuria that's defined as an increase in um, protein, an albumin creatinine ratio of greater than 300, you're still at a very high risk for kidney disease progression and complication development. So it's very important that you take in consideration both the GFR and the albumin creatinine ratio. Why are we, why am I talking about kidney disease? So kidney disease is a worldwide health crisis. It affects about 10% of the population. About 37 million American adults have this disease. Um, with our population and advances in medical science, with everyone, um, with the age increasing, uh, life expectancy increasing every year that we're alive, the risk of kidney disease increases as well, because as we know, kidney disease is a disease of the elderly in most cases. After the age of 40, we lose one ml per minute of GFR. So as you get into the 80th and 90th decade, it's very common for you to have GFRs below 60. Um, chronic kidney disease patients are at an increased risk for cardiovascular disease, um, end-stage renal disease, malignancy, infection, and mortality. The reason I made cardiovascular disease red is because patients are more likely to die from cardiovascular disease than to progress to ESRD. When you look at all the chronic kidney disease population, if you look at 37 million Americans, the percent of patients that actually reach end-stage kidney disease is around 1%. You're mostly going to have patients that unfortunately pass away or suffer consequences of cardiovascular disease before you even reach end-stage. On the right-hand side of the page, I put a picture of an infographic, and um, this infographic just basically says kidney disease is the ninth leading cause of death. Um, but this infographic is actually focusing on African Americans, and unfortunately with this disease, we do see disparities. We have Africans, um, African Americans are three times more likely to be affected by this disease in comparison to Caucasians or Hispanics. So it's very important that you do take a good history on your patients and um, do screen them for kidney disease, especially for those that are at higher risk. I'm going to take a second to just draw, um, just draw the message home about cardiovascular disease uh, with these two graphs, and then we're done talking about cardiovascular disease for the rest of this <laughs> presentation. The first graph here is the prevalence of common cardiovascular diseases in patients with and without CKD. The, um, the percentage of patients is here, and on the bottom is cardiovascular disease. Um, on the left-hand side, I just want to want you to pay attention to this left-hand column, which says any CV disease, including acute MI, um, CAD, having a stroke, having um, peripheral arterial disease. The yellow bar is patients that don't have CKD. And you can see here it's about 32%. In patients that do have CKD, your risk of CVD is about 65, so twofold. Next, we're going to look at heart failure with inpatients with and without CKD. Um, the bottom access here is um, starting with patients without CKD going to any CKD. Next is stages one to two of CKD, three and four and five. As you can see, as you progress through the stages, your percentile of patients that are affected by heart failure does improve. And you can just see that all heart failure in um, Stages four and five of CKD are almost 41%, which is just um, huge. So as you progress through CKD, um, you're more likely to develop heart failure and suffer from cardiovascular um, disease. Now, what causes CKD? It doesn't really matter what causes it, whether it's 
diabetes, hypertension, the pathogenesis of CKD is really the same. It starts with a decreased number of nephrons. Then you have adaptive hyperfiltration, which increases glomerular permeability, leading to proteinuria and later um, in, uh, tubular interstitial fibrosis and secondary FSGS. You also have an increase in renin aldosterone angiotensin system or RAS. With RAS increase, it increases the single nephron GFR, which basically means that the nephron units that are working, the GFR is severely increased because you have RAS inhibition. And that in turn is a kind of a circle in and of itself because when you increase GFR, this is adaptive hyperfiltration, then the RAS continues to increase. So it's a little vicious cycle. So essentially you have a vicious cycle of proteinuria, hypertension, and this all translates to decreased GFR, decreased urine output, and systemic complications. So what causes kidney disease? The number one cause of kidney disease worldwide is hands down diabetes and high blood pressure. And the best things that you can do to combat the progression of the disease happens to deal with glycemic control and managing blood pressure. Um, very common question that I get asked is, um, what type of diabetes? More so common in ty diabetes type two uh, than in comparison to diabetes type one, okay? And we're gonna be talking about sort of some of the things that you can do for your patients that have chronic kidney disease a little bit later in the um, presentation. All right, so speaking of actually, we're gonna jump into it right now. Um, so, or um, we're actually gonna jump into um, AKI versus CKD now. So let's talk about the reversible causes of renal failure. So the first question you got to ask yourself when a patient comes in is, am I dealing with acute kidney injury? You have to screen for hypovolemia in your patients, nausea, vomiting, are they on a lot of diuretics? Hypotension is very important. A lot of our patients have renal vascular disease, so they may have disease affecting the uh, arterial supply to the kidneys. So our blood pressure target in these patients could actually need to be a little bit higher. So when you start them on medications and their blood pressure may be appearingly normal. They're in the 110s to 120s. This could actually be a little bit lower for our patient population. Next is very, very common infections, um, big cause of um, uh, AKI. You also want to look at nephrotoxic agents. So one thing I do want to mention is that in a physiologic kidney, RAS inhibitors are great. But when you cause, when the kidney is undergoing hypovolemia or hypotension, there's intraglomerular tube, uh, feedback that helps preserve the blood flow in the glomerulus. When you're on RAS inhibitors and when you're on NSAIDs, those two medications affect the afferent and the efferent arterial in the glomerulus. So when you're in a hypovolemic state and, you're, um, and your glomerulus is trying to you know, dilate the afferent and constrict the efferent, it's not able to do so because you're on these medications. So a lot of patients that have a little bit of hypovolemia can develop very severe ATN when they're on these medications. So very important to screen to make sure patients are, on, um, are off the medications. Or if you're not sure whether or not this is contributing to lower kidney function, definitely stop the ACE inhibitor and monitor um, the creatinine. Uh, furthermore, you also want to make sure that you look for common things. Antibiotics, one of the most famous USMLE questions is about aminoglycosides and AKI. Make sure they're not on aminoglycosides. One thing I do want to also mention is um, Bactrim is a medication um, where the medication actually interferes with the creatinine assay and also can increase the secretion of creatinine. So you may have an appearingly elevated creatinine in the setting of a normal BUN, but that's just because you're on Bactrim. That doesn't translate to acute kidney injury. So it's very important for you guys to be on the lookout that if there's a little elevation in creatinine, it's not necessarily translate to AKI. And lastly, screen for urinary tract obstruction. By far, I think the best way to tell whether or not someone has acute kidney injury versus chronic kidney disease is by doing a really good history and physical. Um, more so than testing for any test, uh, a, lot of uh, a lot of people say, oh, can we check a fractional excretion of sodium in these, case, uh, in these patients? Where the fractional excretion of sodium is basically measuring what the kidney is doing with sodium at a particular time. Um, but unfortunately, when you have patients that have kidney disease, 
um, you don't have normal findings in the fractional excretion of sodium because disease tubules don't reabsorb sodium as effectively. So don't use fractional excretion of sodium when it comes to determining whether someone, um, uh, uh, determining whether this is AKI or CKD or in patients that do have CKD. Next, you want to take a look at the onset. Um, you want to make sure that um, this is something that's acute or this is something that's been going on for a long period of time. If it's been going on for three months, then this is most likely probably chronic kidney disease. You also want to take a look at kidney ultrasound. Kidney ultrasound can tell you if this process has been going on for a long period of time. If you have small necrotic kidneys, like kidneys that are about nine or 10 centimeters, uh, less than 10 centimeters, so small, like nine centimeters, then you have an idea that this is a chronic process um, because the kidneys are essentially atrophic. Also, they, if they have some degree of echogenicity that's picked up on the ultrasound, that can also give you a clue that there is some dysfunction. Finally, you wanna do empiric treatment. So you wanna treat the underlying process. If you think it's stopping antibiotics, stop the antibiotics. If you think it's giving fluids, give fluids. If you think that they're overloaded and you wanna give them diuretics, give them diuretics. See if empiric treatments works when it comes to reversing creatinine um, when it comes to reversing the insult. If it does work, then you have your answer. It's acute kidney injury. If it doesn't work, then it's most likely chronic kidney disease. Last thing is, is if you want to really figure out what's going on, you can always do a renal biopsy and that'll tell you whether or not there's a acute process, chronic process, or a little bit of both. Okay, so let's go into what we can do to prevent or slow the progression of kidney disease. Um, couple of things that we can do. A couple of things that we already mentioned is that blood pressure and diabetes are the number one and number two cause, uh, number two and number one causes of chronic kidney disease. So managing these will help slow the rate of progression. In addition, reducing proteinuria, reducing the amount of protein intake patients have um, are also very important. Furthermore, uh, smoking cessation has been showed that if you stop smoking, you slow the rate of progression. Um, and then metabolic acidosis treatment. So metabolic acidosis happens to be a complication of chronic kidney disease. So we're gonna talk about it in the complication section, but just for this section, we're gonna be talking about blood pressure, proteinuria redu reduction, protein control, and glycemic control. So what is the pathophysiology of, um, of hypertension and CKD? Well, unfortunately it's a web, um, of issues. With reduced glomerular mass, you have endothelial dysfunction, which causes peripheral vasoconstriction, which eventually leads to systemic blood pressure elevation. You also have increased RAS activation. You have a decrease in sodium excretion that leads to uh, sodium retention. And furthermore, you have sympathetic nervous system overactivity. And um, I'm Another kind of um, small point that I have with this web is, is that it's kind of in a linear fashion, but unfortunately, um, when you do activate RAS, you do um, kind of feed back into reduced glomerular mass um, because RAS activation actually causes fibrosis of the kidney. So it's kind of a vicious cycle of if you have hypertension, you're causing continuous damage within the kidney. Um, so blood pressure, what are our goals? For most patients, our blood pressure goal is a blood pressure less than 140 over 90. If you have a patient with proteinuria and chronic kidney disease, your goal is less than 130 over 80. Um, like I mentioned before, not all patients, um, you have to target a very strict blood pressure goal. If someone has a higher systolic blood pressure um, or like has a high pulse pressure, so the difference between the systolic and the diastolic blood pressure is quite significant. You want to target a higher systolic blood pressure. Also, you want to consider special populations. Patients that have polycystic kidney disease, your blood pressure goal is lower. It's 120 over 80, um, below 120 over 80. And then um, our patients that have renal vascular disease, again, our blood pressure goal is a little bit higher. Um, you also want to promote low salt intake. Just because patients are on blood pressure medication or diuretics or RAS inhibition, if they're intaking five to six grams of salt per day, it's the medications are not gonna work. Um, low salt intake really helps because it reduces fluid retention and it augments the effects of diuretics and RAS inhibition. Finally, um, a, a big, about one third of our patients have resistant hypertension. 
Resistant hypertension is basically patients that are on four or more blood pressure medications um, or are on three blood pressure medication and have some evidence of end organ damage. A big question that um, we get a lot of times in our clinic is whether to start them on a mineral corticoid receptor antagonist and RAS inhibition. I say that you can start spironolactone and lisinopril, but just be very, very cautious for hyperkalemia and reduction in GFR. If you do notice hyperkalemia, try and do a low potassium diet or dial back on either one of the medications. Um, lastly, we're gonna talk, um, lastly, one thing that chronic kidney disease patients lose is the normal nocturnal dipping of blood pressure. Patients that have a normal nocturnal dipping of blood pressure essentially have better outcomes overall, cardiovascular disease outcomes. We recommend that you dose at least one antihypertensive before bedtime to help enhance that nocturnal dipping of blood pressure to improve outcomes. Lastly, if they, um, you also have to um, address the volume status. If someone has 30 liters of water on them, their blood pressure is gonna be high. So increase your doses of diuretics and also consider adding a thiazide to your loop diuretic because this is synergistic. And also recommend your patients weigh themselves every day at the same time with the same amount of clothes and have an idea of variation for bowel movements or what they ate or drank the day before. Um, proteinuria reduction. So as I mentioned before, if you have higher proteinuria, you're more likely to have a rapid decline in your GFR. We wanna target a lower blood pressure by far, the first line agent for proteinuria reduction is RAS inhibitors, so ACE and ARBs. Um, non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, so like verapamil, that is actually has some proteinuric effects. So if you can't start someone on a um, RAS inhibition due to hyperkalemia, then definitely reach for calcium channel blockers. After calcium channel blockers, you can reach for a mineral corticoid uh, receptor antagonist. They also have some proteinuric effect and a slight diuretic effect that can help you, your patients. We do actually have a proteinuria goal. It's not always achievable depending on the process that you're dealing with, um, but our goal for patients that are non-diabetic and have proteinuria with kidney disease is to reduce their proteinuria for less than one gram per day. If you can't reduce it to less than 1, point, uh, 1 gram per day, we want to titrate um, RAS inhibitors or calcium channel blockers. So we have a reduction of 50 to 60% from the baseline proteinuria, or, and the total proteinuria per day is less than 3.5 grams. So we wanna make them non-nephrotic and reduce their proteinuria by 50 to 60%. Uh, recommendations for us, so we typically recommend doing an initial 24-hour um, check for urine protein excretion, but even in the most controlled circumstances, this is very tough to do. Um, after the initial 24-hour protein uh, excretion check, you can then um, check a, sp a spot protein to creatinine ratio or albumin to creatinine ratio to follow it. Um, so um, it's definitely really hard to do a 24-hour urine collection of protein. If you are going to do it, do a 24-hour collection of creatinine as well. So you can see whether or not someone under or over collected or correct, uh, collected the perfect amount of urine in 24 hours. And lastly, low salt diet is very important. Nutrition and chronic kidney disease is everything. If you have protein energy wasting, as this um, red diagram shows, um, you are more susceptible for infection, cardiovascular disease, frailty, and depression, and a whole slew of causes, um, a whole slew of issues in chronic kidney disease cause protein energy wasting, such as uremic toxins, comorbid conditions, and metabolic derangements. Essentially, if you want your patients to be thoroughly counseled, we recommend referral to a dietitian. Um, dietitians will basically break down the renal diet, which is making sure they have adequate caloric intake. Reducing the protein intake is very, very important. So they need to be on 0.6 to 0.8 uh, kilograms per day. They need to be on a low salt, low potassium, low phosphorus, magnesium restricted diet. And fluid intake is a big question that our patients ask. Essentially, it's very tough. Um, you want your patients to stay hydrated, but you don't want them to um, drink so much that they have lower extremity edema. So again, recommending that they um, watch their weights and taking into account what their other comorbid conditions are when you give them a fluid intake um, estimate. We're gonna talk about glycemic control. So diabetes, number one cause of kidney disease. Um, if you control your sugars when you have 
chronic kidney disease, you reduce the occurrence and progression of nephropathy. Um, our hemoglobin A1C goal is essentially not too low or not too high. If it is too low or too high, we've shown that uh, patients are at risk for increased mortality. So our target hemoglobin A1C is around 7%. You also want to consider that hemoglobin A1C um, may be inaccurate in some chronic kidney disease patients. You may have acidosis that could in interfere with it or anemia. So consider alternatives if someone has a seemingly normal uh, hemoglobin A1C but is hyperglycemic such as fructose fructosamine or glycosylated albumin. Lastly, um, you want to target a higher hemoglobin A1C if patients have shorter life expectancy, have a higher risk of hypoglycemia or hypoglycemia unawareness. And um, with our landmark trial that recently came out, you want to treat with SGLT2s. Um, recently, a, med a trial called Credence came out where they essentially studied canoglyphosin, which is an SGLT2 inhibitor. Um, in patients with kidney disease, and they wanted to see whether or not it slowed kidney disease and whether it impacted cardiovascular events. And we found that um, this was a strong, a pretty positive study, a very exciting study in uh, the nephrology community, but it definitely slows um, uh, diabetic kidney disease progression and lowers cardiovascular events. So please consider SGLT2 inhibitors if they are available to you. Let's talk about the treatment of complications. In order for us to talk about the treatment of complications, we basically just have to look at what the kidney function, um, what normal kidney function does, and then go into what the dysfunction that occurs that happens with kidney disease. So normal functions of kidney disease include sodium balance. If you have CKD, then you have sodium um, retention and volume overload. And we sort of talked about that in the earlier section of managing blood pressure and volume status. Um, next, um, kidneys, um, the kidney function uh, includes potassium excretion. If you don't have normal functioning kidneys, you're gonna develop hyperkalemia. It also um, helps with acid excretion. Again, if you don't have normal functioning kidneys, you're gonna develop acidosis. Kidney functions also impact calcium and phosphorus balance. With dysfunction of these, you develop mineral bone disorders. And finally, it um, promotes uh, erythropoiesis. And if you have abnormalities in kidney disease, you are um, going to develop anemia. So we're gonna talk about all of these in a little bit of detail. Um, because we've already talked about volume overload and hypertension, we're just gonna kind of touch on each topic very, very um, briefly. Um, and another topic that I forgot to mention in the above diagram, two topics, is uh, CKD also causes dyslipidemia and sexual dysfunction. So it's very important to keep an eye out for those and manage them if they do pop up. So mechanisms of hyperkalemia and chronic kidney disease, there's a whole slew of reasons why you can develop hyperkalemia. You can develop hyperkalemia if you have acute kidney injury. You can develop hyperkalemia in the setting of diabetes or cardiovascular disease. But here in the top right-hand corner of this diagram, the major causes of uh, hyperkalemia in CKD is metabolic acidosis, which causes potassium shift into the extracellular space, um, kidney transplantation, and dietary modification, so increased dietary intake of potassium. Um, so that means, what does that mean for our patients? We need to limit the dietary intake of potassium. And we also wanna avoid salt substitutes. So a lot of patients know that they should be on a low salt diet, so they'll reach for a salt substitute. And unfortunately, the salt substitutes are basically replacing sodium for potassium. So you wanna screen your patients to see whether or not they're using the salt substitute and how much, and take a look at the back of the salt substitute to make sure that they're not ingesting too much. Um, you also want to stop NSAIDs, COX-2 inhibitors, and case-bearing diuretics. Um, because blood pressure and proteinuria is so important for um, our patient population, consider reducing the beta blocker and RAS inhibition if patients are do have hyperkalemia. Um, if you um, really want them to be on an ACE inhibitor because of um, the fact that they have proteinuria but they are hyperkalemic, consider adding a loop or thiazide diuretic. Finally, if you um, exhaust all of those options, there are um, oral therapy for hyperkalemia. We have uh, sodium polystyrene sulfate and two new drugs that just came out on the market, pteromir and ZS9. Um, these are um, basically potassium binding agents where you take it um, once a day and it uh, binds the potassium in your stool. Um, there are pros and cons for each. 
Um, you really just have to take a look at your patient and determine which is the right one for them. There is a beautiful review article that was written in 2019 that goes over the pros and cons for each of these medications. So if you are considering a potassium binding agent, I recommend that you look into that review article. Next, metabolic acidosis. So with metabolic acidosis, um, you have um, many long-term uh, consequences that occur. Um, so when you start with renal impairment on this circular um, uh, diagram here, you decrease acid secretion by the kidneys and CKD patients. Our short-term response is to increase endothelium, aldosterone, angiotensin, which again, as we know, immediately feeds into renal impairment. Our long-term consequences include kidney fibrosis, um, proteinuria, inflammation, and sodium and water retention. When you take a look at the bodily effects of um, uh, chronic metabolic acidosis, um, when you have acid buffering, um, it leads to a loss of bone density. So you're at a higher risk of fractures, renal osteodystrophy. You have increased protein catabolism. So as we mentioned before, muscle wasting and reduced renal acid secretion leads to reduced kidney function. Um, so what is, uh, what is chronic metabolic acidosis? The definition is when the serum bicarbonate is less than 22. You want to start replacement with bicarbonate with, um, with at a dose of one milliequivalent per kg per day. Um, on the right hand side, this is the different forms of um, base that are available for the treatment of chronic metabolic acidosis. We can recommend restriction of proteins, um, increasing your diet in fruits and vegetables. We also have um, both sodium bicarbonate tablets, enteric coated bicarbonate, um, shoal solution, which is uh, citric acid. There are um, some at-home remedies for chronic metabolic acidosis. Baking soda happens to be one of them. A new remedy that just came on the market that uh, I am part of the medical advisory board for is Triceta. It's very similar to um, uh, to Pateromir or ZS9 in, uh, from hyperkalemia as it binds um, the acid in the gut and it secretes it through the stool. Um, but depending on, um, uh, depending on how much bicarbonate your patient needs, I recommend looking at all of these different options. If someone needs a little bit of bicarbonate replacement therapy, reach for the sodium bicarbonate tablets because one tablet of um, bicarbonate is equal to eight milliequivalents. So if they only need a little, you can just give them a little bit of sodium bicarbonate. If they need more, reach for citric acid or baking soda. Um, citric acid has one milliequivalent per one ml and baking soda, one teaspoon is equal to, I think um, quite a significant number. I, I forget right now, but I think it's like around 24 milliequivalents. So, Take a look at what the requirements are, and based off of that, choose the appropriate uh, form of base that's needed. Next, we're going to talk about mineral bone disease. So essentially, when you have reduced phosphorus excretion, which occurs in the kidney, you increase your serum phosphorus level. In the bone, this increases an enzyme called FGF23. FGF23 reduces phosphorus absorption in the kidney, and it also leads to the reduction of the conversion of activated vitamin D, so inactive to active. What that leads to is reduced activated vitamin D, that's sensed by your parathyroid gland, and increased PTH secretion occurs as a result. Also with reduction in conversion of active vitamin D, this impacts your gut, you reduce the amount of calcium you absorb, and you reduce the amount of phosphorus that absorbs, and then um, as a result, it's kind of like a vicious cycle that kind of feeds into each other. So essentially what we're dealing with when it comes to mineral bone disease is phosphorus, vitamin D, calcium, and parathyroid hormone. Um, why should we care? Uh, unfortunately, when you have mineral bone disease, you can have um, many laboratory abnormalities, as we mentioned, um, disorders with vitamin D, um, hypo or hyperkalemia, hyperparathyroidism, and hyperphosphatemia. And this leads to a number of bone diseases, including osteomalacia, fractures, and osteoporosis, and a number of extra uh, skeletal calcifications, such as coronary artery disease, vascular calcification. And I think the most feared complication for mineral bone disease happens to be calciphylaxis, where you have tissue calcification um, in uh, the peripheral veins of the body, which leads to necrosis. So it's uh, very, um, 
scary disease situation, which is very, um, which is very easily preventable. And when you look at prevention, it just comes down to phosphorus, calcium, vitamin D, and PTH management. Our goal phosphorus for these patients is between 3.5 to 5.5, and we want to recommend that they stay on a low phosphorus diet. We want to keep the calcium not too high, no hypocalcemia, and not uh, no hypercalcemia, and not too low, no hypocalcemia. We want to keep it within normal limits. And also, very important, please correct the calcium for albumin. Um, if you don't correct it, oftentimes it may seem a little bit lower than it actually is. Next, you want to correct vitamin D deficiency, and you want to avoid hypo or hyperparathyroidism. I always start with PTH. So if your PTH is elevated in chronic kidney disease, which is defined when your PTH is above 150, first thing you do is look at your phosphorus. If your phosphorus is high, you have to stop there and you have to treat it before you treat cal uh, hypocalcemia and vitamin D deficiency. The issue is, is that if you treat, um, if you start calcium replacement and vitamin D replacement in the setting of hyperphosphatemia, you can actually cause calciphylaxis or um, uh, vascular disease. So it's very important. First, get the phosphorus under control. You want to use phosphorus binders. Please avoid aluminum binders as you can cause aluminum toxicity. But if your phos is above, you know, 10, 11, 12, incredibly high, you can use aluminum-based binders to initially bring it down and then switch to uh, another phos binder. Once your hyperphosphatemia is under control, look at um, whether or not you have hypocalcemia. If you have hypocalcemia, give the calcium supplementation. Next, you also wanna look at vitamin D deficiency. If they have vitamin D deficiency, treat it, and this can help your um, parathyroid hormone come down. Now, if you did all of this stuff and they still have worsening hyperparathyroidism, use calcitriol or any vitamin D analog, and you can also reach for calcium emetics like sinicalcet, which essentially shut down the parathyroid. You can use them um, individually, you can use them both together, um, but if the patient is still hyperthyroid or um, have complications as a result of this, you wanna go for a parathyroidectomy. Um, the last thing I wanna say is I don't know where else in the world um, they have bone biopsies, but here in the United States, bone mineral um, density scans are not very reliable in CKD, uh, mineral, um, in CKD patients. So if you have a high uh, suspicion that someone may have osteoporosis, you want to get a bone biopsy to take a look. Um, next, we're going to talk about anemia and CKD. Why should we care about anemia? Well, over 75% of patients with CKD stage 5 will have um, uh, anemia. Normally, anemia will present as normal cytic, normal chromic. Um, in men, it's defined when the hemoglobin is less than 13. Women, it's less than 12. When we have anemia, um, we've noticed that our patients with CKD have increased morbidity and mortality. And um, anemia is an independent predictor of death in stable CAD patients with CKD, and it can also promote the progression of CKD. On the right here, I have this sort of vicious cycle. I know this is like a theme in this, um, in this uh, presentation, but really uh, CKD is a vicious cycle that really um, the complications really feed into itself um, with anemia here. As you can see, if you have kidney disease down in the bottom right, this leads to peritubular death and dysregulation of EPO production and release leading to anemia. If you have LVH, this translates to hypoxia, vasodilation, volume overload, tachycardia, increased cardiac output, and this in turn causes CHF. CHF can feed into anemia by itself. CFF, CHF can also feed into the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, which again leads to more LVH and leads to more CKD. So pretty vicious cycle when it comes to anemia. Um, pathophysiology of anemia wise, um, we have increased hepcidin production from the liver um, that can be promoted by inflammation. This inhibits um, duodenal um, reabsorption of iron in the, um, du uh, in the gut and also uh, impairs macrophage recycling of iron. Um, hepcidin essentially leads to reduced renal clearance, which uh, reduces EPO production, and that's another way that it can cause um, anemia. So essentially, hepcidin both um, impacts the absorption of iron from the gut and also reduces renal clearance, reducing EPO production in the kidney.
um, treatment. So basically address correctable causes. If they have vitamin B12 deficiency or any sort of other anemia related issue, um, please treat that and investigate for that. If they have iron um, deficiency, um, we define iron deficiency if the ferritin is less than 500 or if the iron set is less than 30. Trial um, oral iron for about one to three months. Um, a big question we always receive is um, whether or not to do oral or IV. I say it really depends. If someone has severe anemia and is in a pro-inflammatory state, and I don't think any oral iron is really going to touch their anemia, then I'm going to reach for IV iron. Um, or if someone was started on a trial of oral iron and they didn't respond correctly, then go to IV. You also want to look at the availability um, and patient compliance because patients need to go back and forth to an infusion center to receive all their infusions and costs. Also, um, I would avoid IV iron in the setting of active systemic infections as this can make it worse. Um, when it comes to um, EPO, we usually start recombinant EPO when the hemoglobin is less than 10. Um, our goal hemoglobin for our patients is equal to about 11.5. Um, we found that when we place patients on EPO, they have a reduced need for blood transfusions, improved survival. Um, so EPO, um, giving EPO to these patients uh, can really impact their quality of life um, as well. Um, we also want to be very cautious about giving EPO in the setting of um, stroke, malignancy, and uncontrolled hypertension, as EPO can make these things worse. Finally, if um, one of your patients that have CKD have very severe anemia where they need a blood transfusion, um, try and do whatever you can before that um, to address any sort of iron deficiency or um, giving them any EPO. If you know you do have to give them a transfusion. Um, make sure you try and minimize it and fully explain the risks of blood transfusions to the patient. Um, we also want to reduce um, allosensitization in patients that are good kidney transplant candidates. So if you're going to transfuse patients that are active on the kidney transplant waiting list, give them leuco-reduced RBCs um, as, this presents, uh, as, this presents, as this prevents allosensitization. Next, um, very quickly, dyslipidemia is pretty straightforward. Um, KDGO recommends that if you have patients um, with, um, that are over the age of 50, um, irrespective of where they are in CKD, they need a statin. If they're below the age of 50, um, you know, check if they have CAD, MI, diabetes, and stroke. Also, lifestyle modifications are incredibly important. Lastly, sexual dysfunction. Um, over here on the right-hand side, you can see this, um, this diagram of chronic kidney disease, which essentially causes male sexual dysfunction. Um, what you want to do is definitely screen patients um, to see if they have any dysfunction and treat it. Um, you can treat it with hormone replacement therapy, correction of anemia, treatment of underlying depression. Uh, a huge population of patients with CKD and ESRD have depression. So often treat treating underlying depression does help with sexual dysfunction and changes in lifestyle. Um, do I have enough time to go into identification and preparation of patients? And do realize it's 945. <laughs> um, hold on. Ankur, is that okay? It's just a very short section. It'll take like another three minutes, I promise. Yeah, I think that's fine. That's fine. Okay. Um, so very quickly, um, when do your patients need renal replacement therapy? It really comes down to if you're not able to manage the complications of kidney disease. So if you have refractory uh, metabolic derangements like hyperkalemia and acidosis, if you can't manage the fluid or if they keep coming in with um, poorly, um, with incredibly high blood pressure or flash pulmonary edema. Um, one indication to start immediately is uremic pericarditis and pleuritis. Um, another indication is uremic encephalopathy and neuropathy. Um, furthermore, bleeding diathesis is very important. Um, but, but majority of these circumstances can be dealt with. A small population of patients actually present with these things and then we initiate dialysis. 
the majority of your patients will actually, um, that you'll be initiating dialysis on, will come into clinic and they will be complaining of persistent nausea, vomiting, anorexia, and malnutrition. So it's typically in the patients that are um, with a GFR below 15 that we talk to them, we explain what are some of the symptoms of kidney disease, and we follow up with them very frequently. And they're the ones that tell us that they're experiencing these symptoms, and that's when we initiate. When it comes to initiation, you have to make sure that the patient is appropriate for renal replacement therapy. Um, if you have patients that are more appropriate for conservative management, like patients that are elderly with multiple comorbidities, and where if you start dialysis, it's really not going to improve life expectancy, um, do active palliative care for those patients and use other support services. So like talk to, um, get a dietitian on board, have social work see them, reduce the number of medications um, and with, that they're taking with pharmacy, get mental health or geriatrics on board. When it comes to, if the patient is appropriate, um, when do you start discussing um, renal replacement therapy? We usually recommend starting discussing renal replacement therapy when the GFR drops below 30. Um, but we don't prepare patients for dialysis until late CKD stage four, so when the GFR is around 20 or 25. Um, and then when we do discuss the type of modality, we present three modalities, which is hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, and kidney transplantation. Um, peritoneal dialysis, very simply, here's a diagram that kind of shows what happens. Essentially, you have a drain that goes into the peritoneal cavity. It's attached to dialysate solution. The solution goes into the peritoneal cavity. Exchange occurs through the peritoneal membrane, and then um, it's drained out. And then basically, um, you do this every night, and you're, um, you have a sequence of um, the fluid going into the belly and then coming out at night, and you basically unhook yourself. If patients do need a peritoneal dialysis catheter, we usually place it 10 to 14 days before. Um, if you need to use it a little bit earlier, we can um, use it with adjusting the treatment a little bit. Um, and it's performed at home daily. And essentially, peritoneal dialysis is associated with a better quality of life. Um, so if you have someone that's a really good peritoneal dialysis candidate, um, please refer them early and have them go to classes where they can understand um, how to do peritoneal dialysis and get comfortable with it earlier on, as opposed to one later in this game when they're uremic and um, need dialysis a little bit sooner. Hemodialysis is essentially can be in home or at center. It's done at least three times a week. You need vascular access. If you take a look at the diagram, you have, you need vascular access because we need um, access that can, um, where one needle essentially takes the blood flow through a filter and a dialyzer where it meets dialysate. And we need to bring that blood into the back, uh, back into the body. So vas vascular access is needed, either an AV fistula or an AV graft. Um, we recommend referring to the vascular surgeon a little bit earlier um, when your GFR is around 20 to 25. And very important, if someone has chronic kidney disease and the GFR is below 30, preserve the non-dominant hand to the best of your ability. So if I'm right-handed, I'm not gonna use my left hand for blood pressure checks, no IV, no pick lines, no blood draws if possible. Preserve this arm to the best of your ability for vascular access. Um, finally, kidney transplantation, by far it's the most cost-effective modality. Um, if you do receive a kidney transplant, you have an improved, improved quality of life and improved mortality rate. We usually recommend referring patients um, when the GFR is around 20. Early or preemptive transplantation um, offers the best results, and that's an even better results if they have a living kidney donor that comes forward on their behalf. So have the conversation about kidney transplantation early in the kidney disease process so people can ask their friends or family about kidney donation. So in summary, um, chronic kidney disease is associated with a higher risk of cardiovascular disease, ESRD, infection, malignancy, and mortality. Management of cardio, uh, uh, CKD includes treatment of the reversible causes and preventing and slowing the progression of CKD. Beware of CKD complications and handle them as they develop and identify patients who may require renal replacement therapy and um, who may require renal, renal replacement therapy and adequately prepare them with timely discussions and referrals to vascular surgery or kidney transplantation. If you guys are interested in looking at additional resources, um, National Kidney Foundation, USRDS, Kidney, Nas uh, Kidney 
um, disease education program are great resources for you to check out. For our society guidelines, you can take a look at NKF KDOKI, um, um, K -Doki, which is a Kidney Disease Outcomes and Quality Initiative, and KDGO, which is an international group, which is Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcomes. They have guidelines for all of our kidney um, disease-related complications and issues. And finally, if you have patients that are interested in learning more about kidney disease, there's an e-kidney clinic um, that is uh, created by the Veterans Affairs Hospital that you can refer your patients to and it'll walk through patients, uh, uh, it'll walk patients through what kidney disease is um, all the way up to what type of modalities they can choose. With that, um, I thank you guys and I, um, I'm ready to answer any questions that you may have.